chapter number 14. And I would like to uh, bring um, a kind of a message today that is very simple. And uh, it's uh, what in my uh, poor opinionated mind is a... Uh, uh, I hesitate to say it, but uh, to me, a kind of fun message. Uh, but all of them are fun to me. Now, I mean fun as in reverent before the Lord. That's fun to me. Uh, what's fun to a lot of the world is not fun to me. I'd rather be in the Bible. But this will be a kind of simple message that uh, I hope you might see too. The three simple points that I'm going to make. Now, before I tell you those three simple points, I, in Proverbs chapter number 14, note that there are several verses in this chapter that are very well known to anyone who's been around the Bible at any length of time at all. For instance, verse number 12, there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, uh, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And then in verse number 23, in all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. Of course, one of the very uh, perhaps best well-known verse from the chapter uh, comes in verse number 34 because you've heard me quote it so very many times where the Bible says righteousness exalteth a nation but sin is a reproach to any people and we want to remember that in our country don't think that America is above uh, falling don't ever get the idea that America can stand on its own it can't except the Lord keep the city the watchman waketh but in vain we should remember that and God's people need to doubly pray for it in this uh, day of decay in which we live. But the verse that I want to go to is verse number 32. And uh, probably you'll think, uh, well, uh, this going back and forth between Houston and Austin is finally getting to the preacher. Uh, his mind is getting a little weaker and so on and so forth. Uh, but, well, maybe you're right. I don't know about that. I wish you wouldn't tell me, though, uh, because if I don't know about it, ignorance is bliss, as they say. In verse number 32, though, I find these words that I'd like to call your attention to. The wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous, righteous hath hope in his death. Now, in this particular verse, I first of all need to look just a little bit at the first part before I get into the second part, which is the message today. The wicked is driven away in his own wickedness. Uh, can kind of be thought of in this way. And I know this will be foreign to a lot of thinking, but maybe you can think on it and get something out of it eventually. Uh, the wicked are driven by their own wickedness. Uh, motivated by their own wickedness. And it is my opinion that wickedness does motivate a lot of people. I think that ultimately their wickedness will drive them away. Away from God further, etc., etc. Having said that then, I know that we are living in a what can I say? Wicked day. As I mentioned earlier, I, I see things going on, I hear things going on that I never, never had the wildest imagination would ever be out in the open. I know many people may say, well, you grew up in a naive home, so on and so forth. Uh, that may be, but a lot of stuff that is open and out in the wild now, I think perhaps has always been around, but it was kept in the closet. Now it's as if things have turned around. I believe that even in our country, there are efforts to put righteousness in the closet and let evil come out all over the place. And 
it's a it's a driving force as it is. Uh, for instance, you'll find uh, I believe that uh, there is violence inbred in that crowd. I I believe that uh, violence such as was in the days of Noah, uh, such as was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, is becoming rampant even in the United States of America. And as the fear of God index declines, wickedness has fertile ground in which to flourish. And I believe that we are at that state in our country. Well, with that then, I go to the next phrase, but the righteous hath hope in his death. That's the part that I want to basically dwell on today. And uh, point number one of this message is the righteous hath hope in his death. Uh, point number two is the righteous hath hope in his death. And point number three is the righteous have hope in his death. So now, with that, you're thinking, oh boy, good, I can fall apart, or I can fall asleep uh, in uh, the last two-thirds of this message. Well, okay, just don't snore too loud is all I've got to say. Now, first of all, the righteous hath hope in his death. Wickedness is great in our world. Now you can see that by just reading a little bit on the internet. And the language that is out in the open by the politicians who are supposed to represent uh, diplomacy and uh, honesty and integrity, etc., etc., that has almost become a great, great joke. Our country is in the balance. Or perhaps it's no longer in the balance, just waiting for judgment. I do not know one or the other. But I will say this, that it gets on my nerves a lot of times. I mean, I look at people... Uh, such as on Sunday, uh, the uh, football stadiums will be full, uh, the racetracks will be full, the boxing arenas, I don't know what all they have out there, the casinos will be full, like, uh, all that kind of thing, uh, and yet the churches by and large will be empty. And I think to myself, uh, Lord, um, how long? How long, O oh Lord? And then I think of this, though, point number one of the message. Uh, the righteous hath hope in, um, in his death. Now, don't, uh, don't uh, be unkind to me uh, when I say this, um, but uh, the wicked are not going to last forever. And the righteous do have hope. Uh, in the death of the wicked. Now, now listen. I don't. I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean that I want to see anyone uh, spend eternity in hell whatsoever. Uh, but I, I want to tell you this: there have been wicked men before in this world, and wicked women before in this world, uh, such as the Jezebels and so on and so forth. But I, I want to say this: they died. In fact, the Bible has a whole chapter in it, practically every verse. It says, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he died. And so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. And I will say this, that the ones who get on the Christians' nerves the greatest, they're not going to last forever. They are day by day growing old, and they are going to die. Uh, it's kind of like um, Madeline Murray O'Hare. I've deliberately taken polls before in church of how many of you remember Madeline Murray O'Hare. And some of you older people may remember her, but uh, she's the big atheist figure. Uh, she's the one that, um, through her son, got the Supreme Court uh, basically to... Uh, 
dethrone prayer in public schools and so on, uh, as if it were ever enthroned at all anyway. But, uh, I know she got on a lot of people's nerves, Christian people's nerves, and uh, maybe some of you here who remember her uh, will remember when she moved from, was it Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, to Austin, Texas, mind you. And uh, ultimately, though, while she made uh, many people just furious, and I, I know we're all supposed to be peacemakers, uh, brother, I'm trying, I'm working on that. That's a great lesson in Sunday school, if it wouldn't have stepped on my toes so much. But I, I, uh, I know that Madeline Murray O'Hare got on a lot of people's nerves, but now, uh, hey, listen, she was in my lifetime, big time. I remember the day when I was in high school, after the Supreme Court ruling came out on prayer, it was the only time in our high school, top three grades, 10, 11, and 12, was just in our high school. 2,500 kids in high school. I was a senior that year. And we had devotions every morning over the loudspeakers in every room. Uh, we couldn't all meet together in one place. Uh, Different kids would give the devotion, perhaps read something from the Bible, and then pray or have silent prayer. I remember one time the principal of our school, the chief principal of our school, gave the devotion and prayed himself over the phone, and it was the day after the Supreme Court came out with that ruling. As if he were making a statement. I'll never forget that. And I remember how infuriated many ministers were. I remember how many Christians could not believe that that would happen. Well, boy, we've come a long way down from that since then, is all I've got to say. But the righteous hath hope. I, don't, I hope you won't take this wrong. But the righteous hath hope in the death of the wicked. The physical death of the wicked. They're not going to last forever. They're growing old day by day. The day is going to come when they too are going to have to stand before God. And I mean all of this talk today of political corruption and these foundations that the rich have and so on and the calumny that goes on, the, the different things going on, uh, just never you mind. God is still on the throne, and the righteous path hope. I imagine a lot of them got very upset back in the Old Testament days with the wickedness that went on there. In fact, uh, you may recall that one of the prophets was sorely upset because God was using a country more wicked than they to punish them. Do you remember that? Uh, how can you use Nebuchadnezzar? Why, that Babylonian empire is more wicked than we are. Uh, I know we're wicked, but they're worse than we are. Yeah, but they knew better in Israel. However, the day came when the Babylonian Empire went the way of death too. Do you remember Belshazzar? The day came when the hand wrote on the wall. And it's always interested me that when the hand wrote on the wall, Belshazzar got scared. And as Alexander White said in his great work, Bible Characters, Belshazzar, why are you so scared? Surely that is thy God coming to write your praise. Are you not gathered here in Bel's name? Are you not gathered here to praise him? Are not all these servants to Bel? Do you not bring these vessels from the house of the God you don't believe in to have your partying to Baal and all this? Surely that is Baal's hand come to give thee a blessing. But no, his knees smote the one against the other. Why? Because when God comes, people know it. 
When God comes knocking on your door, you know it's God standing at the door. And Belshazzar was going on just like nothing was going to happen to him. Do you remember the story from the 5th of Daniel there? How that he told Daniel, I'm going to make you third in the kingdom. And Daniel said, no, I don't want to be in your kingdom. And he, and he made him third ruler anyway. Did you catch that in Daniel chapter number 5? As if Daniel's prophecy wasn't going to come true. Remember Daniel told him, uh, hey, you're fat weighed in the balances and found wanting and the kingdom's going to be taken from you. And that night, Darius the Mede was at the door and the Babylonian Empire was no more. The righteous hath hope in his death. I would like to say that that's the way it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. I have no doubt that Abraham knew what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't you think that? Why did he get to the point where he got down to just ten? If you find ten righteous there. And even Lot, the Bible tells us that that just man vexed his righteous soul. And I know it was well camouflaged in his antics in Sodom as many Christians are well camouflaged today. But the Bible still says that he vexed his righteous soul. And hey, listen, there are a lot of good people uh, in our country today that are dumbfounded by what's going on. Uh, they can't get it. Well, let me suggest, it's not going to last forever. You have hope in his death. I want to go to point number two. The righteous hath hope in his death. I want to switch now from the death of the wicked to the death of the righteous. As I stand at this pulpit this morning, I'm getting older. I know what you're thinking. Why, Brother Burkholder, you don't look like it. You could easily be mistaken for a college boy. Etc., etc., etc. Well, let me say this. As I stand here, I'm getting older. As you sit there, you're getting older. And you're going to die one of these days. It is appointed and the man wants to die. And after this, the judgment. Now, I know what some of you are already thinking. Well, unless the Lord comes first. Yeah, but you're going to have to go through that experience that might be called death. If death is a separation from the conscious existence from the body, you're going to be shed of this old carcass and have the glorified body. The so one way or the other, the, the righteous, I have hope in my death. And you say, what's wrong with you? You want to die? Well, I have mixed feelings about it. To tell you the truth, I can't help it. I always have during my life. Even in the second coming of Christ, I admit when I was young, uh, the thoughts did go through my mind uh, back when my mother was telling me that it was my job to watch all those tech girls. Uh, I, I, I thought to myself, you know, I would like to get married to Marcia before the Lord came. <laughs> And I don't look so shocked. I bet every one of you out there have thought before you'd like to do something before the Lord came. Well, well, so what? He's going to come in his perfect timing anyway. Uh, but as I get older and as I see this world deteriorating, uh, I have hope in my death. As I see my body deteriorating, I have hope in my death. Uh, think about... Uh, uh, this old uh, body, flesh and blood, that doth not inherit the kingdom of God. And I, I think about uh, the fact that uh, I don't have the strength that I used to have. I know this will come as a shock to you, but when I was back in a ki as a kid in the high school and in the furniture business, uh, I, I, I w was able to do things with my muscles that I could no more do now than the man in the moon. Uh, back then, uh, a lot of stuff was made out of solid wood, solid rock maple, uh, or solid walnut. I mean, a lot of that stuff was heavy. I rem I'll never forget when I was in the ninth grade and I first started out at the furniture store uh, trying to help them deliver because they had so much business and were so shy on people. Uh, and so they got me to come down 
I made the grand total of a buck an hour and they put me on a delivery truck delivering stuff and I'll never forget uh, the first time they didn't tell me in advance that we had a hide -a bed to deliver. I was just a ninth grader in uh, high school and, and I was uh, uh, relatively healthy and so on and so forth but have any of you here ever picked up one end of a hide -a bed? My word! I I remember it was put on the truck for us, but there were two of us in the truck, and I had to be one on one end of that hide a bed, and the other guy had to be on the other. Now back in those days, they made the things out of steel frames yes. and hard hard woods, and those things were heavy. They aren't like the stuff now. I mean, that was a one heavy sofa. Hide a bed. I will never forget the first time I had to carry one end of a hide a bed into the house. And uh, of course, you want to you want to look halfway dignified if you can. You don't want people to think you're a weakling. Did I get my mic on? I guess I got it on. I mean, you, you don't want you, you want to look dignified and uh, show how strong you are. And I, I thought, I, I thought, I thought, oh Lord, please help me not to drop this thing before we get it into the. Uh, and then, so we got praise the Lord. The Lord helped me through that. And then we had another one to deliver, a uh, Dulaney. And I overheard them talking in the office there. And uh, they talked about uh, uh, delivering this dude, Laney. And I heard one of the guys say, do you think he can handle that? And I thought, oh no, are they wondering about me? And um, the other guy said, I don't know. He said, uh, it's heavier uh, than any of the other hide beds And it was. And, and this guy said, well, he handled one the other day. Uh, you ought to be able to do this. And out I went. I had forewarning. It had been better not to have the forewarning. But before I was out of the ninth grade, I'd handled so many hide beds and so many triple rock maple dressers and some of them by myself, even having to the point where I would deliver refrigerators by myself and so on and so forth. And I had gotten so strong in my muscles and my arms. I know, Marcia, now as you look at me, you're scared of my muscle. Uh, but uh, I, I had muscles so great. Uh, I went into the uh, gym one day and the ropes were down and I thought I wonder why the ropes are down and they, they said we're gonna have to climb those ropes today and they won't let us use our feet and I thought oh boy what am I gonna do but I'd been working at the furniture store lifting that stuff all along I tell you what I went up that rope lickety split faster than anybody else just using my hands hand over hand and I, I hit the top first and then came down. No problem. I remember one time in the same gym class, uh, I was framed. <laughs> I, it was a setup. And the gym teacher came in. I wasn't doing nothing. Uh, and, uh, but but he, he, he thought I was. And he gave us three choices. We could either check out of the class, go to the principal's office, uh, or uh, do, uh, take uh, three licks from him. They give licks in school back in my day. Any of you guys here know what licks are? Yes, sir. It's not. Pardon the indignity. <laughs> That's not what I meant. A lick was a board. Yes. And, and you didn't want the gym teacher giving you a board. And he said, but he gave us a choice. You can either check out, go to the principal's office, and I couldn't do that because I knew they were going to call my mother. <laughs> and, uh, it's better to keep some stuff to yourselves <laughs> sometimes. I couldn't do that. The other option was to get three licks from the teacher or get down here in front of everybody and do 50 push ups. Now at the beginning of every gym class we usually did like maybe 20 push-ups and the guys would groan and moan. And, and when we did push-ups in those days, we did push-ups. They don't do push-ups in these days. I saw some dude the other day trying to do push-ups on uh, uh, television and, and he went... He, he go down about two inches. 
Back when it was my day, your chest had to touch the ground. Any of you guys remember that? Surely some of you military guys remember. I mean, you had to hit that ground and then go up with it. And so we had, I, 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 I knew to myself, well, I've been in the furniture business. I climbed that rope faster than anybody else. I believe I can do 50 push-ups easier than I want 50, three licks. And I sure want to try that other than my mother. I got down there and I did 50. Hit the ground with my chest up, 50 of them just right up, one right after another. Now I know you won't believe that. I couldn't do that now. I, I'm not sure I could do one or two push-ups now. I'm not even interested in doing it. My old body is getting older. I'm, I'm going to be shed of this carcass one of these days though. I have hope in my death. Not only do I have hope in that vein, but man, I have hope of laying my burdens down, mental burdens, soul burdens, heart burdens down at the feet of Jesus Christ. I have hope in my death. I've often thought to myself when I die, if anybody thinks to weep, don't weep for me. There may be rejoicing, I don't know. But be that as it may, don't weep for me because I'll be in heaven with the Lord. I have hope in my death. Now listen, everybody in this room today is going to die one of these days. You youngsters, you young people, death is no respecter of persons. I know you plan for tomorrow. And in one vein, I'm thinking that it is wise for us to plan for tomorrow. Is it not? But boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Right? Listen, everybody in the room today is headed for death. Everybody in the world today is headed for death. I have hope in my death. In fact, I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul. Do you remember what he had to say? For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In fact, do you remember that the Apostle Paul said he had a desire to depart and be with the Lord? Now, I know the shrinks of today would call that an unhealthy desire, suicidal thoughts and so on. No, he didn't. He wasn't going to commit suicide. He was here to live for Christ. But he said he did have a desire to depart and to be with the Lord. Maybe some of you are like that here this morning. Maybe some of you here today have thought before, uh, boy, I'll be glad when the Lord comes. I know a lot of us have said that, uh, haven't we? Uh, maybe some of you have said, well, boy, uh, when I die, uh, it's going to be the best moment in my life uh, because I'm going to be with the Lord in heaven. Now listen, I have hope in my death. I, will, I really won't be dead. I'll be alive with the Lord in heaven. It's kind of like when we first went to Houston and Jerry Pyle, you remember Jerry? I mean, Jer what was he, seven feet tall? Uh, close to it anyway. And you know how tall I am. He and I were good friends. And I'll never forget the time he took me over to the officer's club to have lunch at the, uh, what is that, Fort Huachuca in uh, the... Yeah, uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona. Uh, he took me over there, and uh, it looked like Mike and Jeff uh, between him and me. Uh, the only thing was, he had a bad heart. And um, you remember when we moved to Houston? I often felt like the Lord moved me to Houston at the right time, because I, I guess within a couple of months after I moved to Houston. Two church members from a church in Elfrida, Arizona came down to um, doctors Denton Cooley and Michael DeBakey who pioneered heart transplants uh, to have heart work done in Houston. And uh, the Lord worked it out where I was there. And that may not seem much to you, but to the wives of those people. They were glad to see somebody they knew. They were from a town of 200, Alfreda, Arizona, and they came down to a town of 
well over two million. And I remember one of them saying to me as she saw me coming down the hall, uh, oh, finally. What she meant is somebody she knew and uh, her former pastor. So I felt like the Lord moved us down there. Jerry Piles was one of the guys that came down there for a, a heart. I can't remember what they were going to do. Anyway, he had to have heart operation and they wanted to come to Houston to the Texas Medical Center to get it done. And they came down there and uh, I, I married Jerry. He wasn't married uh, when I went there and I married performed the ceremony for Jerry and his wife and they came down to Houston. Uh, they stayed with us, you may recall, in the apartment we lived in when I first moved uh, to Houston to pastor the church there. And uh, I remember um, on Wednesday night service, uh, Jerry had been operated on that morning. And I remember just right before my Bible message, one of the ushers discreetly came up and gave me a note saying that the call had just come in that Jerry had died. And Marsh and I went down uh, to their hotel. They were staying close to TMC at that time. Houston's a big place, as you guys well know. And uh, our church was a long way from the Texas Medical Center. They were staying at the hotel at the time. We went down to the hotel and... Uh, you remember that um, Jerry's mother and dad were there and you remember that Jerry's mother was weeping and uh, I was their former pastor uh, still kind of their pastor in their mind uh, and uh, I was trying to comfort them and and in the in the comforting statements being made of course they loved the Lord but we sorrow but not as those who have no hope um, and Mrs. Piles, Jerry's mother, said she didn't believe he ever woke up from the operation. Uh, and I know she was saying it as his mother, kind of to comfort herself that he didn't suffer, that he just went on to be with the Lord. And the thought hit me all of a sudden. And I said it out loud. Boy, I'll bet he's awake now. Yeah. I have hope in my death. And I got to tell you something else, part B to the point too, is I have hope in the death of other Christians. For we sorrow, but not as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. And that leads me to the third point in my message. And it is just this. I have hope in his death. I can have hope in my death because Jesus died on the cross for me. I have hope in his death. Brothers and sisters, I tell you this. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I have hope in his death. At the cross of Calvary, the Lord Jesus took my sin upon himself. You know the wages of sin is death. And we often quote that verse thinking of the idea of eternal death in hell. I know that. But did you know the Lord Jesus died in our stead? And it is because Jesus died at Calvary, was buried and rose again the third day. 
that I can go to heaven. And so I'll put it this way, wherein doth my hope lie? It is in Jesus Christ our Lord. I have hope in his death. And the wonderful thing is, the third day he came forth out of that grave. Not weak, not in need of food and water. He conquered death, sin, hell, and the grave. I have hope because Jesus died for me. And he not only died for me, but he died for the sins of the whole world. It only is going to count, though, for those who accept the Lord Jesus as their Savior. We come automatically lost. We have to do something to get saved. I've heard it said over and over and over, you don't have to do anything. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, and that's true. But there is something you do have to do in order to be saved. Do I not speak the truth? You have to believe in Jesus Christ and accept Him as your Lord and Savior. You have to be accepting of His sacrifice at Calvary for your sin, of His gloriously conquering sin when He rose from the dead. And so, I have hope. I have hope in His death. And that so outweighs and overshadows every other thing that my first point becomes in some ways obsolete because my focus is on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I would like to read the song, the lyrics to the song, The Solid Rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. I have hope in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. How about you? May we stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Goodness to us. I thank you, Lord God, that we're able to be gathered today in thy house. And I pray, Lord, that the hope... Thy children have in death may take over the focus of their life. And thus may they be motivated and driven of Thee, knowing that one of these days they'll be carried away by Thee to the glorious heaven. I pray, Lord God, that those who are here and unsaved may today see their need of Christ as Savior. I pray, O God Almighty, that Thou wouldst grant Thy people 
the strength to be as they should be for thee and grant that those who are not thy people shall have their hearts and minds illuminated by thy Holy Spirit to the extent of their being motivated to come to Christ today. In his glorious name I ask it. Amen.